Hello all. Today we're going to look at the history and meaning behind the rhyme Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Let's dive right in. The version we know today goes as follows. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Who was this Mary who was so good they named her twice? Why was she seen as contrary? And what's the meaning behind silver bells and cockle shells? And can we identify the maids all in a row? We'll also explore if there's any truth in the theory that the rhyme is really about torture devices and the flowers grow so beautifully in the garden because it's full of graves of religious martyrs. The oldest version in print, as with many of the most famous nursery rhymes, is found in Tom Thumb's Pretty Songbook, published in 1744. It's almost exactly as we know the rhyme today, but with a slight change to the title to Mistress Mary, and the maids are absent from the last line. Indeed, it's the last line which sees the most variation over time. In a version published in the 1780s, it changes to sing cockles all in a row. A cockled is a derogatory term for a man whose wife is having an affair. The term would have been well known to 18th century readers, as it was also the name of a hugely popular country dance dating from 1650. Here's the music, and I've provided a link below if you're interested in hearing it. You might notice that in the little woodcut image, the four men waiting in a row are wearing horns. It's the cockle's signature headgear, which opens up a whole series of questions about the life of our mistress Mary before she took up horticulture. We'll return to this aspect of the rhyme later. Other versions, dating from the 18th and 19th century, are altogether more wholesome, as the rhyme moved from the chat books, which were for adults, and into the children's nursery. Now the rows are filled with cowslips and columbine and mussels and lady bells. Pretty maids only became the agreed final line in the late 19th century. Nevertheless, a version with this ending may have been known much earlier. Poems about ladies in a row existed as early as the 1570s. Leaving the last line to one side for a moment, all the versions are consistent in their advice that for a garden to grow effectively, silver bells and cockle shells are a must. The meaning behind these lines sends those who enjoy speculating on the origins of nursery rhymes into overdrive, which is always fun. So let's explore. The key meaning of the rhyme rests on who you think Mary might be. The traditional explanation is that the rhyme is about Mary, Queen of Scots, one of the most enigmatic figures in British history. Mary was born in 1542 as the only surviving legitimate child of James V of Scotland. She was only six days old when her father died, and under the guidance of her French mother, Mary of Guise, she was sent to live in France. She married the Dauphin, the future King Francis II, in 1558. His early death in 1560 meant Mary was compelled to return to Scotland, a country she hardly knew, and in which, in her absence, the Scottish Reformation had taken hold. Scotland had increasingly come under the influence of the Presbyterian firebrand John Knox, and if we view the rhyme from the Protestant perspective, it could be seen as condemning Mary as contrary, a Catholic queen in a Protestant country. In this reading, the cockle shells might allude to a dress worn by Mary, adorned with shells supposedly given to her by the French king, the pious Scottish Presbyterians mocking Mary for her ostentatious Catholic fashions. Alternatively, we could view the rhyme as being recited by Catholics, lamenting the loss of the Catholic faith. Talk of silver bells could mean the sanctus bells or altar bells rung by the priests as part of the Catholic mass. With this line of reasoning, the cockle shells could signify the motif of the pilgrims on the trail to the tomb of St. James, the Camino de Santiago, ending in Santiago de Compostela in Galicia in northern Spain. This imagery would have been well understood by any Catholic, although why supporters of Mary would describe her as contrary, I'm not sure. This brings us to the maids in the row. On this point, there seems to be general agreement by both Catholics and Protestants. We know that Mary, Queen of Scots, had four ladies-in-waiting, who supported her through her early life in France and then on her return to Scotland. These maids in a row, Mary Seaton, Mary Fleming, Mary Beaton and Mary Livingston, and surprisingly known as the Four Marys. Alternatively, if we apply the line cockles in a row, remember, that's a husband who's being cheated on by his wife, we could apply this to Mary, whose marital history was dramatic in the extreme. 
After her short union with Francis, she then had two further ill-fated Scottish marriages, the first with Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. During this short marriage, it was rumoured she was having an affair with her private secretary, David Rizzio. A jealous Darnley was part of a murderous plot. Rizzio was having dinner with Mary and was confronted by a group of Scottish nobles. He was dragged to an adjoining room and stabbed to death. However, within a year, Darnley himself was murdered. This time implicated in the murder of Darnley was James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. It was rumoured that Bothwell was having an affair with Mary. While later historians question whether there was any truth in these infidelities, it certainly fits with the rhyme, and later generations would have known the scandal around Mary. But perhaps we're looking at the wrong Mary entirely. There was, of course, another famous Mary from this period, Mary Tudor, Queen of England and cousin to Mary, Queen of Scots. Maybe she was the quite contrary Mary. This interpretation of the rhyme is much more dramatic and gruesome, with tales of torture and martyrs being burned to the stake. Now, without wanting to be a killjoy, as far as I can tell, this theory first appears only in 2003. It's a passing comment in Chris Roberts's heavy words lightly thrown, but it's been enthusiastically taken up by books and websites ever since. Who am I to say whether this is because linking nursery rhymes to bloody tales of murder might be good clickbait? If only someone would write a definitive book about the origins of nursery rhymes and the theories behind them. Nevertheless, it's quite an interesting tale of religious genocide, so let's explore. Mary was the first daughter of Henry VIII and reigned from 1553 to 1558. Despite the shortness of her rule, they were tumultuous times. She vigorously attempted to reverse the English reformation of her father and brother, Edward VI, striving to restore the Catholic faith. The methods she employed were gruesome in the extreme, burning at the stake some 280 religious dissenters, and it's this legacy of torture which leads us back to the rhyme. Let's run through the theories. Firstly, as with Mary Queen of Scots, she's been characterised as contrary, a Catholic queen in a Protestant country. And this is where it gets bloody. Apparently the garden grows so vigorously thanks to the buried bodies of dead martyrs. Alternatively, Garden could be a play on words for Stephen Gardiner, the Bishop of Winchester. He had been put in prison by Edward VI on the grounds that he hadn't agreed to the King's reforms. Mary immediately released Gardiner, reappointed him the Bishop of Winchester, and made him Lord Chancellor, the closest adviser to the Queen. Now, how do we interpret silver bells and cockle shells? A quick search online will see the macabre claim that these were names of torture devices employed by Mary against those pesky Protestants. The story goes that the silver bells were thumbscrews. Now, thumbscrews certainly were employed by lots of monarchs through this period, but I can't find any evidence that they were called silver bells. Feel free to write in the comments section if you know different. Meanwhile, lots of online sources have cockle shells looking like this. Apparently they had a negative effect on the genitalia or rectum. But this is actually a pair of anguish, and while it certainly looks ghastly, there's no evidence of it ever being used, so I'm not convinced. This gruesome interpretation of the rhyme continues in the final line, that the maids in a row were either Mary's stillborn children, or, even more gruesome, they allude to an early form of guillotine, the implication being that Mary, or for that matter Mary Queen of Scots, employed them as part of the persecution of Protestants. The problem with this theory is that while there were indeed early forms of guillotines in England and Scotland, namely the Halifax gibbet and the Scottish maiden, they were hardly ever used during the reign of either of our Marys, and only for common criminals and never for religious martyrs. So where does that leave us, dear viewer? As with any rhyme, the meaning is lost in time, and we're left as happy guessers. In previous videos, I've shown some scepticism about applying a historical meaning to a rhyme when the events occurred hundreds of years before we see the rhyme in print. That said, I think the Mary Queen of Scots theory has some merit. The Georgians were certainly aware of the stories of Mary, and one could imagine our forebears writing a rhyme about her in the 1700s especially when you consider the Tommy Thumb version is right in the middle of the Jacobite rebellions of 1715 and 1745. This was an attempt to return the Catholic Stuarts the throne of Britain. It was led by Mary's direct descendant, James Stuart, the Old Pretender, 
and his more famous son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, a rhyme, albeit rather opaque in form, ridiculing their attempts at seizing the throne, might have been very popular fare at the time. Let me know what you think in the comments. Well, I hope you enjoyed this gruesome horticultural tale. I want to say a very special thank you to all of you who subscribed to my channel so far and provided comments, and I hope you come back again when we explore more rhymes and fairy tales together. Bye for now!